In the name of Allah, the most beneficent and the most merciful. Assalamu alaikum. My name is uh, Jaime Fletcher or Mujahid Fletcher. I accepted Islam approximately 11 years ago after looking into many different religions and I would say bumping my head, you know, uh, living uh, what some may say as a troubled youth, right? I was a leader of a gang when I was 13 years old and I had a lot of questions about life and I wanted straight answers and I looked all around, many people had many opinions, but when I found the Quran and I realized that this book had never been changed, I uh, analyzed it as I had done for many other religions like Christianity and Buddhism and Hinduism, Kabbalah, which is ancient Jewish uh, mysticism. And so when I looked into the Quran, it, I realized that this book was a bit different than everything else that I had studied. And when I started going to the mosque and realizing that they did have answers, I went back and forth for about a year and asked many questions. And the more questions I asked, the more certainty I obtained. And eventually I felt like I wanted to change my life for the best. And I accepted Islam. And ever since then, uh, I found peace. I found um, a life free from contradiction. And I think that that is something that everybody's looking for, straight answers, not just about the creator of the heavens and the earth and what he wants from us, but about life in general, because Islam is a way of life. So it helped me uh, solidify my relationship with my family. Um, some of my family members have even gone on to accept Islam. And so now Islam is a way of life for us, is um, an alternative uh, lifestyle that um, we, 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 we don't know what we would do without it. You know, that's become the best gift that uh, the Creator could have given us. The toughest trial when a person accepts Islam, at least in my opinion, is when we come in contact with the Muslim community. Sometimes we look at the Muslim community and we think that whatever we read in the Quran and in the narrations of the Prophet is exactly what we're going to get from the people who are practicing that faith. But we'll soon come to realize that um, even in Christianity or any other faith, nobody can really embody every single uh, law, right? So with Islam, because we don't know it, we look at the actions of Muslims. And then if someone, I remember for example, I was trying to leave smoking cigarettes. And there was a Muslim outside the mosque smoking cigarettes. So all of a sudden I went to him and I said, is this in Islam? Is this in religion? Right? It would make it easy for me. Like if he says yes, then I don't have to be smoking. But he said, you know, he turned it off and he said, you know, um, you're going to be a better Muslim than me. You know? And that was the answer. And I was like, well, is it in the religion or not? You know? So when I started seeing that sometimes there was a contradiction between what was Islam and what was the action of Muslims, I realized that it was a test. Because you can't rely on what people are doing anymore. So you have to become very aware of what they should be doing and what I should be doing. And that leads us to learn. And then comes the aspect of who to ask. Who do we take our knowledge from? And so it begins a whole search and, and, and you know, re-identifying um, you know, our, our, our belief about life and understanding. And so it's a challenge basically to go through all of these cultural sort of vehicles that happen right because we may have people from different ethnicities and we may be from a different ethnicity so we have to realize that islam is universal and when we see it from the pure core from the sources from the quran and the sunnah the tradition of the prophet all of a sudden we realize that all the different ethnicities and all different people uh can participate in it and uh, we're all challenged to be the best about what the text calls us to do in theory and uh, try to implement it so after that the main challenge is how well can I implement it without looking at others and trying to compare myself or trying to compare them? Then it becomes a journey of you being judged by Allah alone and uh, being sincere in it and um, just trying to do your best. When I embraced Islam, it was three months before September 11th. So sometimes as new Muslims, we look at our situation and say, uh, especially young new Muslims, I embraced Islam when I was 23. So I began questioning and asking myself, what am I going to do now? Uh, I, have, I had wasted a lot of time before because I wasn't focused. And Islam gave me focus. Uh, September 11th happened three months after I embraced Islam. So when I was looking to see what profession I actually wanted to carry out, 
Um, when September 11th happened, the Muslims were very weak in media. They didn't have uh, a proper representation in public relations in the image of Islam for the American public. And I started asking myself, if I wasn't Muslim, I maybe wouldn't even like the Muslims because of the way that they're being portrayed in the media. So I took it upon myself to take on a profession that was unique to our community, uh, which is media production, basically. I went and studied multimedia, which is... Um, combination of video production, audio production, web design, and graphic design. And my wife, who had just embraced Islam as well, uh, found out that she loved graphic design. So we went into uh, a very, um, uh, the, the best art school basically that, that we have in technology in Houston, the Art Institute of Houston. And um, as Muslims there, um, we began to educate our environment about who the Muslims were. The Dean of Education, I remember, would step out of his office for us to make salat in our times of prayer knowing that muslims were being seen somehow in the media i did a lot of projects with video production and audio explaining what islam was and they realized that as long as these skills went on to communicate a message to society that's what we we're about so i think that my profession coincided with being able to do something for Islam and I knew eventually I could have a profession where I could actually make a living and at the same time serve Islam. So at my graduation, my wife and I graduated with honors. Um, we, I, I was hired by a, an upscale home builder as a marketing director my first month out of uh, college and I worked there for about three years and I gained a lot of experience and I launched my own business at the same time that I was working there and due to the need of the Latino community asking about Islam, instead of us going and coming and talking so many places, we began to generate audio and visual material uh, to be more efficient for us so that we could just distribute it. And instead of speaking to millions of people, we would distribute basically two millions of people online. So we created an organization called Islam in Spanish, which went on to educate Latinos about Islam using audio visual uh, uh, our professional skills basically and when we started seeing people embracing Islam asking about Islam and um, we started seeing that speaking engagements were lighter because now we had some material and people could take that give it to their loved ones and so that led over to us wanting to build a studio a production studio and alhamdulillah people like Hakim Alajwan and others uh, Imam Saraj Wahaj and others saw the need for Islam in Spanish due to the fact that we did a television show we should have our own production studio where we can not only produce this, but also now teach media to Muslims, especially the Muslim youth, so that they can be the next generation uh, of people giving the message clearly about who we are. So we also do media trains now in a studio. Uh, it's about a quarter million dollar studio, basically, uh, state-of-the-art uh, production studio facility. And we do film screenings, documentary screenings. We speak about social issues. We bring in people who are not Muslim, and they speak about uh, the social uh, justice uh, issues that they're dealing with and, and we support basically anyone that we can with media so that's gone on to be non-profit or community based work that doesn't um, uh, basically negate my very profession we have an advertising agency called Focus Point Studios um, I'm a producer for Comcast I belong to an organization called the Leap National Association of Latino Independent Producers so we go to Universal Studios Hollywood I was just there with um, Robert Rodriguez uh, the director of Desperado and Spy Kids and so on uh, Rita Moreno from West Side Story um, Dolores Huerta who was a social activist along with uh, uh, Cesar Chavez and so being with these great you know, individuals and seeing the advocacy for Latinos in media and being a Muslim, the only Muslim Spanish person there in Hollywood and seeing all of this and being able to do work uh, at that level, it's a blessing. And so I, I go to New York and uh, have friends in democracy now with Amy Goodman and uh, in, in, in California. I go there and get training uh, and then come back to Houston and then we try to benefit at a local level and speak through universities and so on. So I think the, the way of giving the message, if I, if I didn't have media, I would have to just be speaking and saying so many things. But with media, we just focus on specific issues and it goes globally. So I think the profession is something that we should align ourselves with when we embrace Islam to see what we can do, where we can serve Allah as a wajal and at the same uh, time be able to provide for our families. It's very important. 
when I first embraced Islam, my first Ramadan was very unique because seven months after uh, accepting Islam, I had the opportunity to go to Mecca uh, for Hajj. And in looking at the territory in Mecca, I saw Mount uh, Hira, which is the place where the, the Quran was revealed. In understanding a bit about the Quran and the power of the Quran and how it's revealed for 23 years, to know that there is a month dedicated to this book and that every single night this book is recited in Tarawih as a congregation, right, as a community, and that you as an individual should invest your time in reading the Quran and reflecting. So this is the month of the Quran, pretty much Ramadan. I tried my level best to read the whole Quran. And Alhamdulillah, having the zeal of becoming a new Muslim, I used to want to read a juz, a part of the Quran every single day. And so when Ramadan came, it was like that challenge that I wanted to take on. And then I realized that there was so much going here and there with eating, you know, with the Muslims and invitations. And uh, I realized that it wasn't just sitting with the book, but also coexisting with Muslims. And my family, uh, who had recently embraced Islam, my wife and my father, we were going to a lot of different gatherings, meeting different people. Uh, Non-Muslims were coming to the mosque because food was being served. So it became a month that was actually pretty busy. In the morning, trying to do a personal uh, sort of struggle in, in, in reading this book in the afternoon or evening, breaking the fast and eating and being with the con congregational prayer. And then the last 10 nights come and then it's the prayer at night. So you start seeing all these different opportunities and being a new Muslim, you kind of want to deal with everything. And then you realize that you're limited and um, you know, in time and you're limited in your capacity and so trying to find that balance to where at least you'll make it throughout Ramadan and, and not you know try to hit every little angle but try to do you know one's best I had a lot of friends of mine that had embraced, had embraced the sun and uh, they gave me good advice and alhamdulillah um, I, I think a lot of my family members asked a lot of questions as to why we weren't eating I was working professionally as a marketing director in a company uh, they would ask why I wasn't eating and so it is a month also where we can educate the people who are in the environment and uh, a month of purification you start feeling cleaner um, physically you start feeling even stronger because you don't have so much that our body is processing that holds us down on a daily basis when we eat it's like cleaning our body our mind and uh, spiritually connecting I mean um, it's it's kind of renewing oneself and so the the first Ramadan for myself was like embracing Islam all over again. The youth in the month of Ramadan, when they're going to school, they too are challenged because they are looked at as different, possibly, right? They're not eating, the rest of the people are eating in a cafeteria or whatever the case may be. Um, the youth may take a stance of kind of hiding their fast which is fine because in the month of Ramadan the fasting is for Allah but at the same time if you take a proactive approach and let the environment understand why you know the people who you come in contact with why it is that you're doing what you're doing it makes it uh, an educational opportunity uh, for the rest of the people uh, I know in the city of Houston uh, Ramadan uh, the, the, the MSA in the University of Houston does something called the, the Fastathon and they invite a lot of people who are not Muslim and they basically give in charity if if one person who is not Muslim fast the the organization will give like 10 or 20 dollars basically to a specific charity that benefits like poverty and things like that something everybody agrees to so you find a lot of people who are not Muslim fasting for a specific day for that fastathon and so alhamdulillah um, I've been fortunate to be a speaker there and so they bring in a speaker and then the speaker speaks about the benefits of Ramadan but then we bring up people who have never even thought of fasting before and how they felt and so we bring them up and they get to you know explain their their situation how you know they they couldn't cuss and it was very tough and they never even realized that they couldn't cuss this was this was interesting right somebody else comes up they said well I thought it was all about food but then I realized that 
you know, trying to not talk about people was the most difficult thing for me, right? And these are regular people. And so I think when the, when the youth start looking at all that, they, they start seeing, wow, you know, these people really just for one day pondered upon all these different details and how many of the Muslim youth are just going through the motions and just going to school and, man, you know, I want... You know, I, I want to eat this and that, you know, in Ramadan. Yeah, I mean, w when I break my fast, man, I'm hungry. Or they want to sleep in later sometimes because they're fasting. These sort of tendencies sometimes may come from specific countries because I've lived in the Middle East. And sometimes certain people look at fasting as a day, as days when they go to sleep at Fajr. And they wake up at about one or two in the afternoon so that they don't have to necessarily go through the whole fast of the day. So some youth may have these tendencies and they don't even know where they where it comes from but the youth that really understand the power of the, of the fasting and the purpose behind it when they indulge it they benefit from it friends of theirs may begin to understand some of that and then they can do specific uh events such as that fast-a-thon or things that are creative so that they can make something out of that time because it is a time that all of the good deeds are increased so they should somehow get involved uh, obviously be with family, uh, spend time, you know, eating dinner and, you know, family members, different people, invite people to eat and, and hopefully be in the spirit of, of, of Ramadan because living here in America, you may be in the spirit of other uh, holidays that are being expressed in the environment from the social culture. And you may know, you know, maybe a Muslim may not share in a specific holiday like Halloween, but you go to CVS, Walgreens, anywhere, it's there. Right. So as Muslims, if we don't shape our environment and have people feel something about Ramadan, then they don't get to share in the same diversity that we do, you know, getting the effects of all the other holidays and so on. So if we don't do that ourselves, especially the, the youth with so much energy, then uh, they will come to find out that when their children are growing up as youth, they will realize that they hope that their children fast and they hope that they have Islam. So they have to start now consciously understanding that they have to do something now for the future as well. The new Muslim is like a newborn baby. A newborn baby is not requested by any parent uh, to just get up and run or feed itself. It, it, consciously you know that it's a need. And you take care of it and you nurture it and you do pretty much everything it needs in order to begin crawling and then begin walking and then you can ask of other things. The new Muslim, in the sense of who they are in their new identity, they are at the point where they're like newborn babies. Not just because Allah cleaned their sins and they embraced Islam and all of that, that's great. But if we all of a sudden deal with the new Muslim with all the rules and only deal with rules, it may break them. The same way that we may take a baby and start giving them all kinds of rules. They can't really manage it. So we sometimes forget, as new Muslims, and also the community forgets regarding us, that the Prophet wasallam he had a specific way of dealing with new Muslims. And it took him to teach them the Qur'an and what was being revealed at that time for them to nurture their heart. For 13 years in Mecca, before the ayat were revealed with rules that mainly came in the, in the Medinan period. So it took 13 years for the companions of the Prophet ﷺ to understand the law, his messenger, uh, reward and punishment, right? The day of judgment, things of the unseen. So the new Muslim needs to increase his faith and believe in things of the unseen that are coming from revelation before we go to the physical and begin to say you can't do this and you have to do that because as soon as that happens sometimes it becomes very difficult on them if someone comes and says you need to come and put a piece of tape on this on the floor here every single day at this time it's you know maybe something you do but you don't really want to do it but if somebody says if you don't put that piece of tape there right somebody may trip because elderly people walk through here every day Right? And it's part of your job to come do that, then all of a sudden there's a reason for it. Right? And you may understand and you do it with meaning. Unfortunately, sometimes the nurturing or educational process with the new Muslim is not there. So the community may expect 
that they just go through the motions and have all these rules and they carry them out but they don't really know so there has to be uh, an educational process and there has to be a social sort of effort to be able to deal with the new Muslims invite them to people's homes educate them as the actual uh, uh, time of Ramadan is happening and for the new Muslim as well to understand that he or she cannot amass and do everything perfect because as a new Muslim just like a little kid you know you tell them to do good they want to do all good and they want to be perfect and they get kind of shattered when you tell them they didn't do something right because they, they think they're okay so the same way like the new Muslim for them is just black and white they're either good or they're not so if somebody comes and says you didn't do this right it may shatter them because nobody even told them maybe so we educate them we deal with them with ease and the new Muslims should realize that they're going through a process and they have to be also merciful to themselves because if they don't have mercy on themselves they may break their own selves and so many people come in Islam and want to do everything perfectly and there's a there's a, a hadith in Bukhari where the Prophet ﷺ said not to be extreme not to go beyond basically measure and try to do everything perfect because this deen of Islam will break you and so what we understand by this is that you can't be perfect right you can only try to strive for perfection so the new Muslim should know that this is a time where we try to improve and if we come in Ramadan with a vice or a habit that we don't like and we know Allah doesn't like it and we at least have as a goal that we get rid of that one habit during the month of Ramadan if we condition ourselves every single day to get rid of that habit for 30 days, if you can do that for 30 days, then there's a high probability that you leave it for the rest of the year. And if you came in with a vice and you left without it, that may be the cleanest way to have gained the mercy basically from Allah that Ramadan. And it's that simple with Allah because Allah knows our deficiencies. And if we do something, one thing clearly for Allah, it may be way beyond than trying to do everything properly and right and maybe making mistakes along the way that we don't even realize.